Welcome and thank you for joining today's conference, House Choice Voucher Dashboard Demonstration. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. If you require a clinical assistant, please send a chat to the event producer. All audio lines have been muted until the Q&A portion of the call. We'll give you instructions how to ask questions at that time. With that, I'll turn the call over to Charles Alfonso. Charles, please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Charles Alfonso. I'm the Region 6 Director for Public Housing and uh, I'm with the Housing and Urban Development uh, Department, and I want to thank you all for joining today's webinar. We see this as a commitment to our partnership, and that partnership is essential to maximize our combined efforts to lift people up by providing decent, safe, and affordable housing options to those that need it the most. The Housing Choice Voucher Program is a vital element in doing that. To aid you in maximizing housing opportunities, we want you to have access to the most up-to-date and relevant information possible. Within our region, our field office public housing directors are key members of our team and are always available to help you. Let me uh, tell you who they are right now. From the New Orleans field office, we have Ms. Cheryl Williams. From the San Antonio field office, we have Mr. Dave Poehler. From the Houston field office, we have Ms. Lorraine Walls. From the Oklahoma City office, we have Mr. Greg Youngman. From the Little Rock field office, we have Mr. Anthony Landecker. And from the Dallas-Fort Worth field office, we have Mr. Byron Gully. Again, thank you for joining us. I'll turn it over to Marika, Marika now for today's presentation. Thank you, Charles. Um, my name is Marika Bertram, and I'm part of the Housing Choice Voucher Program here at HUD in the Program Support Division, and I'm excited today to be showcasing um, the new Housing Choice Voucher dashboard with you. Um, so as many of you may have been aware or may not, um, we actually have had a public-facing dashboard for about a year, but unfortunately, this dashboard only showcased data at our national and state level and did not get all the way down to our public housing authority level. That's all changed with our voucher um, 2.0 dashboard. Um, so I'm excited to show that today. Um, what you're going to see here, in order to be able to actually access this dashboard, I'm going to show you how you get there. So we have a HUD.gov website that actually showcases our Housing Choice Voucher dashboard and has two ways of actually accessing the dashboard specifically. You can see the dashboard embedded here within the actual um, website, but for those of us who are a little too small, you can open it via this link right here, which is what I have open. One thing we also want to note within our dashboard um, is that especially with the advent of this new information in, in uh, the Dashboard 2.0 release, we have updated our HCV Voucher Dashboard User Guide and Data Dictionary, which really goes over a lot of how all of the different aspects of the dashboard are calculated, how to use the dashboard, and we strongly encourage you guys to check it out. We also have a video tutorial for how to use this dashboard, which goes over a lot of the different features of it, and it's just another helpful way if you, after this webinar, you want to check out the video, it's right here for your um, enjoyment. And just as a reminder, any, if you have any questions about the Housing Choice Voucher dashboard, either around its data, um, you have suggestions for improvement, you have just questions in general about how to use the dashboard, we encourage you to email us at hcvdashboard at hud.gov, and we're constantly monitoring that email box. So without further delay, I'll launch into the actual dashboard itself. So when you open up the Housing Choice Voucher dashboard, the first thing you're going to notice is it gives you where the data is sourced from in our various HUD administrative systems. So our HUDCAP database for budget, our voucher management system, and our PIC system. And all of the data for this dashboard right here that I'm going to demo today is current as of January 2021. So you'll always want to look here to see what the current vintage of the data is. Now, the reason for the delay in the data is a lot of it has to do with the fact that PHAs have about 60 days to put in their data into the voucher management system before we aggregate that data up and be able to produce it into the dashboard. So that is one of the reasons for this delay. We're actually about to do a February release of this data after we do these webinars with the various PHAs following this release. Um, 
The other thing that you're gonna note is that this report now includes moving to work agencies. In our previous release, we excluded moving to work agencies um, as they have a lot of different trends than um, our regular non-MTW agencies. Um, but we felt that it was really important to showcase that data here as well. And so now the dashboard does include moving to work agencies as a default. So in order to be able to actually access the different report pages of the dashboard, you'll use these um, arrows icons here on the bottom. So for the very first page, it's all about the summary. So until you've made any selections in your drop-down menu, you're always going to default to a national vantage point. So this is gonna give you a really broad overview of what the voucher program looks like as a whole, and then allows you to drill down by your state or public housing authority, or just choose non-MTWs or MTWs. So what this is gonna display here is you're gonna have a very quick and easy way to see your half expenditures versus budget authority, your budget utilization year to date, your uh, total reserve balances as of the reconciliation at the end of the last calendar year, year to date um, leasing utilization, your per unit cost nationwide or for your selection, as well as leasing potential and your overarching budget and unit utilization trends since 2014. Now we do showcase leasing potential here. It's of a lot of interest to HUD right now we do have a wildly important goal, which is for our public um, and Indian housing um, division, which is focusing on increasing utilization for the Housing Choice Voucher Program. And so we actually have an active goal where we are trying to lease more families and reduce the amount of full leasing potential that we see nationwide. Um, and so we think that by shining the light on this, we really think that hopefully we will be able to even um, encourage more leasing utilization and help more families or help families more. Um, so the way that the voucher dashboard works is that you can easily select from the drop-down menu a specific state that you're interested in, as well as a public housing authority. So for example, if I wanna look at the state of Louisiana, you can easily select that state and then go all the way down to selecting a specific housing authority. So if I wanted to see the housing authority of the city of New Orleans, I can easily and quickly see that data at the, at the click of a button and be able to identify what their total reserve balances are, their leasing potential, their average per unit cost, and what those trends have looked like um, for the budget and unit utilization of that program since 2014. Um, so if I want to clear the filters, you'd simply use this button right here and be able to go back to that national vantage point. So going to the next page here, um, what I would show you is a lot of information around budget and reserves. So for example, um, again, all of this is at our nation, our, at our national level. And if we wanted to say, maybe let's go to, how about, New Mexico, and we will see very quickly and easily what is the total budget authority for the Housing Choice Voucher Program in that specific state, New Mexico, what's the overall Housing Choice Voucher reserves, what's the percentage of reserves that is budget, what is the percentage of budget authority that is reserves, as well as seeing a pure number of what is that total amount of reserves and which PHAs are holding the largest amount. Now, one thing we always note here is a disclaimer that identifies the fact that HUD does not recommend that you have a zero reserve balance, not at all. We know that you need a reserve to be able to ensure that you can meet your monthly obligations and ensure the operations of your department. But we do recommend that PHAs tend to not hold more than 4% of their money in reserves if they're a large PHA with over 500 units. We recommend 6% for mid-range PHAs with 250 to 499 units, and about 12% in reserves for PHAs with under 250 units. So you can see right off the bat whether or not, while those reserve balances have pure numbers here, you can also see whether or not those are in that specific um, recommended reserve balance um, percentage. So, um, for example, if we wanted to see um, information around a gift, you know, non-MTW housing authorities, and we wanted to see um, 
for example, NYCHA right here, you can see that while they're holding a huge amount of reserves, that's well within the correct amount that they actually know, should be holding for a PHA of their size. Um, so let's clear our filters and we'll go on to the next page. Um, oh, sorry, this uh, actually also not only includes the highest amounts of total reserves, but you'll be able to see quickly and easily what is the total amount of uh, HAP assistance payments compared to budget authority as a trend, as well as that budget utilization. So if I wanted to look in the state of Arkansas and be able to identify those trends um, and see that for the state or for my specific housing authority, you can quickly and easily do that there. So going into the next page here, um, this really looks at a lot of leasing information. Um, so for example, if I wanted to check out uh, Louisiana again and be able to identify um, some trends, what you'd be able to first see here is that the state of Louisiana as a whole has um, lower than average, lower than the national average leasing utilization. You can see this black line is the national average of leasing utilization, and the state of Louisiana as a whole has less than the national average for leasing utilization. But, for example, if I wanted to look at a specific housing authority, such as the um, Housing Authority of New Orleans, you can see that that's definitely not the case for the Housing Authority of New Orleans. They actually are well above the national average for their leasing utilization. Um, and so that is something that you can easily see here how your PHA or your state compares to the national average. Um, with the selection of New Orleans here, we would be able to also identify the monthly number of vouchers on the street and see how that trend analysis is going, as well as what that average per unit cost has looked like since 2014, and what is the overall average attrition rate on a 12-month annualized basis. So you can see here that the Housing Authority of New Orleans has about 3.46% attrition rate, um, if you wanted to clear the filters and see how that compares to the national average, that's much lower than the national average of 7.34% attrition. So this next sheet here provides a lot of detailed information actually from our PIC system um, around PIC and BMS system around leasing changes. So for example, um, let's go to Louisiana again. And let's check out what we see um, nation uh, for that specific state. So on the right-hand side of your screen, you're going to be able to see quickly and easily which PHAs have had the largest reductions in their units leased over the last year, as well as who has had the largest increases in units leased. Um, and so that's one thing that could be of interest to you. Um, for example, if you wanted to identify what's happening with Lake Charles here, obviously um, Lake Charles just recently had a big disaster with the hurricane coming through, and that is very likely the uh, why so many of their units are not have uh, become unleased uh, over the past year. If we wanted to get into the nitty-gritty around Lake Charles, we can simply click this PHA and be able to easily see um, what are the new admissions for that specific PHA? So you can see what the new admissions in PIC have looked like and whether they're homeless or non-homeless admissions. You can also look at their um, end of participation actions. So you can see that there were quite a few end of participation actions in the beginning and middle of the year, and definitely it's declining over the last um, several months. You can also check out their annualized attrition. Now, the reason for this The uh, data is all showcasing the um, uh, an annualized or 12-month uh, rolling average of the attrition rate. When the hurricane hit, you see a huge spike in that um, annualized attrition numbers right here. And then you can see that obviously Lake Charles, when looking at their vouchers on the street, they are bringing a lot of new resources um, to bear and putting more vouchers on the street here to help um, really uh, increase their utilization and then get back to that um, previous least number after um, the hurricane is hit. So you can see that there's a lot of information within this page that you can interact with um, and be able to see a lot of different data. Now, if you didn't want to look specifically at one given PHA, but you'd rather look at the trend for Louisiana as a whole, uh, again, you can identify that here 
and then be able to look at, you know, the vouchers on the street, their overarching um, unit months available and unit months leased for the program, as well as their leasing utilization. Um, attrition rate for the state of Louisiana. So you can see that while um, in general, the annualized attrition rate in Louisiana is going down, obviously that wasn't the case in Lake Charles and that was due to that specific um, disaster event. You can look at um, EOP participation or end of participation and our new admission trend and see how many of your new admissions in that state are homeless versus non-homeless based on your categorization of that data in PIC. So there's a lot of information there at your fingertips. So going to the next page, what I want to show you is that if you make a selection at the top of your screen for either your state or your public housing authority, that will remain your selection throughout your interaction with the dashboard until you clear those filters. So as you can see here, I have Louisiana selected. And if I go to the next page, which is all about per unit cost, you can see that Louisiana is still the selected um, drop down here. So it does allow you to go between pages and keep those selections rather than having to add and um, those selections for each given report page. So when looking at this, you're going to be able to easily see which, um, which PHAs have had the highest increases in per unit cost over the last five years, as well as who's had any reductions in per unit cost over the last five years their overarching average per unit cost in January of 2021, so that's the current vintage of the data, and then be able to also see the overarching trend for per unit cost um, using monthly data here, and then seeing what that average per unit cost for the overall year um, is over time. Um, and so you can see a lot of different information um, just right at your fingertips to be able to identify different trends that you might be interested in seeing. So let's uh, clear our filters here, and we're going to go on to the next page. Um, this is all about special purpose vouchers. Um, so for example, um, if you want to overall see what is the special purpose vouchers for a given um, state or a given PHA and see what that portfolio is, it'll be right here at your fingertips. Uh, so for example, let's check out Oklahoma. You can see quickly and easily that Oklahoma here has certain PHAs that have um, these special purpose voucher types. So for example, you can quickly see your mainstream vouchers, your family unification vouchers, the VASH vouchers, and your non-elderly disabled vouchers, and which PHAs in that state have these voucher types. And so you'll know quickly which PHAs are able to serve these special populations. You'll also be able to see uh, based on our voucher management system data, VMS data, what is the current um, leasing for those special purpose vouchers. Now, for example, if I know right off the bat that I want to look at a specific housing authority, I can see that uh, the housing authority of the city of Oklahoma City um, has all four of these voucher programs, and I can quickly and easily see the uh, utilization of these special purpose vouchers very quickly. Um, so let me clear that filter and we'll go to the next page, Keeping Oklahoma. This is a page, a report page, that's all about special purpose vouchers as a percent of your total housing choice voucher portfolio. So what we're identifying here is not only what are those special purpose vouchers that, your, um, that those PHAs have, but what is the total amount of, that, of your overarching HCV portfolio that is special purpose vouchers? So for example, in Oklahoma, you can see that about 6.91% of the HCV program is made up of special purpose vouchers. That's lower on average than the national numbers of 9%. And so that's one thing that you might want to be aware of is that the PHAs within Oklahoma tend to have a smaller proportion of their program dedicated to special purpose vouchers in comparison to the national numbers. And you'll always be able to get that list of which um, special purpose vouchers they have and what is that percentage of their portfolio here. Going to the next page, this is really where we start to have a lot of new additions to the voucher dashboard and what makes this voucher dashboard special with the 2.0 release. Um, not only did we add the ability to drill down to the PHA level in the voucher, um, the newest voucher dashboard, but we also added some additional pages. 
such as uh, leasing potential. So we identified leasing potential on that first summary page, but a lot of folks want to get into a lot more detail around that, especially because it is one of our wildly important goals. We want to serve many more families with leasing with this leasing potential, and we want to be able to understand which are the PHAs that are holding on to the largest amount of leasing potential, both in numbers of pure units here, as well as who's holding on to the most amount of leasing potential as a percentage of their program. So quickly and easily, you can see, for example, let's, uh, let's not just pick Los Angeles, uh, Louisiana and uh, Oklahoma. Let's check out uh, the big state of Texas. Um, so in Texas, for example, you can see right off the bat which P that overarchingly we have about 4,700 units of leasing potential where we could either serve more families or serve families more. Um, we also identify which PHAs have the highest amount of uh, leasing potential in peer units. So for example, the housing authority of the city, housing authority of Plano has about 342 units of leasing potential and that's something that um, you know, we would be encouraging our Office of Field Operations to be working with that specific housing authority to help house some more families and utilize that leasing potential that we see here. Um, ultimately, we might also want to know which PHAs have the largest amount of their portfolio is leasing potential. In the state of Texas, it happens to be uh, the Housing Authority of Plano also has the largest percentage of their um, of their HCV program is leasing potential, but that's not always the case. Um, and so this is a quick and easy way of being able to identify which areas or, or which um, PHAs have a lot of leasing potential. Um, and there's definitely a way for our field office staff to be able to know who that they want to be reaching out to to help um, increase their voucher utilization. And so I definitely encourage you guys to check this out. One of the things we include here is a quick um, explanation of how leasing potential is calculated. We do expect that some folks will have questions about how leasing potential is calculated. And if you do have concerns, you can absolutely email us at the HCV dashboard at hud.gov email address. We're also in the midst of writing a clear a document and it's in clearance right now that's all about how leasing potential is calculated, a very in-depth um, explanation, as well as one that includes examples. And that document, um, which is in clearance, is going to be posted here on our external website. Um, and we encourage you to check that out once it's available. So with that, um, I'm going to go to the next pages, which are all about our project-based voucher um, program. So clearing our filters, I want to look at it nationally. Um, so the project-based vouchers have really grown um, in a as a percentage of our Housing Choice Voucher Program over the last several years. And so we thought it would be really interesting and helpful for folks to be able to have more information about project-based vouchers within the dashboard itself. Um, as you can see here with this black line, you can identify that um, back in 2015, only about 1% of the overarching voucher portfolio was project-based vouchers. That's really changed over the last um, five to six years um, with about 10.6% 10 10 of our portfolio is project-based vouchers now. And so that's one of the reasons that we wanted to provide more in-depth information around project-based vouchers. Um, when you're examining this page, there's a lot of information. Anytime you're seeing these buttons, which I've gone over on some of the other pages, it means that there's another visual that you'd be able to see by selecting the button itself. So for example, here, we're gonna look at project-based voucher leasing over time and see how that's, how that's been changing. We also see project-based vouchers, both leased and unleased, and see how that has grown over the past several years. And then what's really interesting to folks is project-based voucher type. So some people want to know, are the project-based vouchers um, overarching non-RAD PBVs, RAD 1 or RAD 2? And you can see here how those different parts of the program have grown over time. So for example, if I wanted to check out, let's go to Texas again, and we want to see how that looks. You can see quickly that RAD2 is actually not part of any of the project-based vouchers that we're seeing in the state of Texas currently. 
Um, all of the project-based factors are either non-RAD PBV or RAD1. And you can see how their, their program as a whole has grown from almost nothing, just 0.2% back in 2015, to about 5.6% of their overall HCV um, voucher program. And so you can see that it is growing. Um, it's still a smaller proportion of uh, their overarching uh, HCV program than the national figures, but it is something that you might want to be aware of. And you can also select a given housing authority and find out how that one's project-based voucher portfolio has grown over time. So getting into the next page, it also focuses on project-based vouchers. This is really showing which, PB, which PHAs have project-based vouchers and what is the percentage of their portfolio that is project-based vouchers while the previous page looked more at the leasing around project-based vouchers specifically. So, for example, here we're showcasing that nationwide we have about uh, 756 PHAs that have project-based vouchers. That includes those that are entering into an AHAP agreement. We have 744 PHAs that are, have project-based vouchers that are under a HAP agreement, and we have 742 PHAs that have PBVs under a HAP agreement that are actually leased. So you can see here there's about two PHAs that actually have project-based vouchers under HAP but haven't leased any of them yet. And then you can see that there's 12 PHAs that are coming into having a project-based voucher portfolio with, those, with having an AHAP agreement in place. What this also showcases here is the fact that there's about 1,400 PHAs that actually have no project-based vouchers at all in their um, Housing Choice Voucher portfolio. But we do have about 50, uh, 40 PHAs that have over 50% of their voucher portfolio is project-based vouchers. And then you can look at this for a given state. So let's, again, like, let's go check out Texas and be able to easily see that 125 of the PHAs um, in Texas have zero project-based vouchers. But there are two here that actually have over 50% of their portfolio. So you can see that the Housing Authority of the City of Brenham and Corpus Christi Housing Authority each have a large amount of project-based vouchers. And then you can see whether or not those are RAD1 or, RAD, or non-RAD PBV and be able to identify what percentage of their portfolio is either type of uh, project-based vouchers. So you can see that, for example, in Corpus Christi, um, the RAD of their project-based vouchers, 87.8% are RAD1, while only 12% are non-RAD PBV. And so you can quickly and easily see this information and also identify that number that we I showed on the first page, which is that at the current moment, we have about 5.6% of their total HCB program is project-based vouchers in the state of Texas. There's a lot of different information here that you might want to check out. Um, and then getting into the last two tabs of our report, what you're going to see is a lot of information that you saw on previous pages. But rather than having to go back and forth, drill into a specific drop-down menu, then go back and compare to the national, et cetera, you can do side-by-side -side voucher comparisons. So, for example, if you'd like to check out your specific state versus the national uh, numbers, you can easily and quickly do that. So, if I wanted to, for example, look at New Mexico and be able to examine how the overall HCV program in New Mexico is compared to the national numbers, you can see here that they have approximately the same amount of money in reserves as a percentage of budget authority as the national numbers. Um, you can also see that they have a little bit less budget utilization um, than the overarching program nationwide. And then you can compare those different trends right here for their budget and unit utilization. Similarly, um, if you go to the next report page, this is also the voucher comparison page, but focuses around leasing and per unit cost. Now, whatever selections you made on that first voucher comparison page, it will flow through here for that, so you can continue that comparative analysis. Um, so, for example, here, you'll be able to see that New Mexico has a lower um, leasing utilization as a whole, for the whole state in comparison to the national numbers. You can see that they have a higher attrition rate than the national figures here, 
and you can see that the overarching per unit cost has been increasing similar to uh, trends that we're seeing nationwide. Um, now, for example, if you wanted to do two PHAs side by side, you'd also be able to do that. So one of the examples I like to showcase um, is looking at the state of Florida, and you can actually decide to choose two different like-sized uh, PHAs. So if you wanted to only do comparisons to PHAs of similar sizes in the same state, you could select the state of Florida, for example, or any um, one that you're interested in, and then look at two different PHAs side by side. So for example, comparing two like-sized PHAs in the state of Florida, Tampa and Miami, you can easily see that, the, that Tampa is holding an appropriate level of reserves at around 4%, which is what we recommend here at HUD for PHAs of that size. We also see that Miami is holding a larger percentage of their money in reserves in, as compared to Tampa. We can also see that they have pretty equivalent budget utilization, although their trend analysis does look quite different. Um, we see that obviously Tampa has a smaller housing uh, budget authority for the Housing Choice Voucher Program than Miami does by approximately half. And you can see that they are holding approximately um, a quarter of what Miami's holding in total reserve amount. And then when you're doing a comparison on the leasing and per unit cost for these two PHAs, what you can see here is that um, the attrition rates are very different. Even though they're both large PHAs in a, in a state, in the same state, what you can see is that obviously the Tampa market is very different than the Miami-Dade housing market. And so you can see that the Miami-Dade housing market has a very low attrition rate while well, the Tampa Housing Authority has a, has a attrition rate more similar to the national average. You can also compare to, can do a comparison between the average per unit cost for these two PHAs. And you can see that up until about that time that the pandemic hit in uh, early 2020, the per unit cost was all over the place in uh, Tampa, but really it hadn't increased significantly from that $700 mark even um, almost six years later, it was only still in the low 700s, and then it was just starting to really inch up. That, that amount of, uh, it was really adjusted and really changed due to, the, due to the coronavirus pandemic with Tampa experiencing skyrocketing per unit costs. Um, which we saw skyrocketing per unit cost nationwide, and so that story in Tampa is just similar to that national picture. What you can notice here within Miami is that they've been having rising per unit costs over the last um, se seven years. Um, and what you can see is that up until um, the start of 2020 with the pandemic, their per unit cost is still already increased by over $200. And then it just really went, um, really increased over that early, those early months of the pandemic. And it's finally starting to have some normalization um, as a result of folks, you know, regaining their jobs back and non-earned income being able to be included for the pocket calculation. So you can see that there's a lot of information here uh, for both doing comparative analysis for your state or your PHA versus the national numbers, your state or your PHA versus um, another hub housing authority. And there's just a lot of information here that we really encourage you guys to check out. Um, so with that, I'm gonna just uh, turn it over, uh, show you that the last page right here um, is all about the fact that we encourage you guys to check out the performance and utilization, the projection and utilization tools um, here, and I will turn it over to Mike LaRisha. Thank you, Marika. Um, so good to be with you. Uh, thanks for all the work you're doing out there. Um, so what we saw was uh, an amazing display of the, the, the current and past uh, data at a level that hasn't been available outside HUD. Uh, what the forecasting tool and other tools will help with is the future, right? So to be able to see where you've been, where you are, and where you are in comparison with others. And the question is, where do you want to go in the future? Or what do you want to do about where you are and where you want to be? And that's where that 
forecasting tool comes in. Um, we've been using it on and off in different variations for over 10 years. It's up on that website, and what's also up on that website are a series of small YouTube videos on every sort of little functional area of the, the tool that you might want to learn about. I would, if you're not familiar with it, I would recommend you take a look at it. Um, it's got, we are constantly sort of improving it, I think, putting new information in there. Um, and in terms of the leasing potential, uh, this is a number that we've been using in a measure for a long time simply just to help HUD identify housing authorities that have money left over that could be used for a purpose. And the purpose is, it's, although it's called leasing potential, the potential is also to use it by increasing your payment standard, right? You could, you could or in combination, house more people and um, provide more people with more help uh, by increasing your payment standard, for, for instance. The tool will show you what your rent burden, uh, what the rent burden of your families uh, is compared to the national norms and over time. So um, one thing you can do is use one of the other tools we have here, this tool that we have that sort of will allow you to bring in PIC data and then generate three other tools, this tool of tools. One of those is a payment standard tool, which allows you to sort of like model what a new payment standard would look like. So if you want to change your two bedroom by $100, your three bedroom by $50, et cetera, you can put it in there and it will calculate what the change in rent burden is for your families by bedroom size and overall, and it will tell you what the cost per unit change would be from doing that by month so that you can sort of work these trade-offs between um, how many people do you want to help versus how much help do you want to give. So uh, I don't want to spend more time on that because I want to leave time for questions, but uh, there's a lot of power in those tools and combined with these insights from this dashboard plus what you could do moving into the future, I think uh, there's some really useful stuff for here for you today to consider. So with that, I think we can open it up for questions. Um, can you repeat the how, how folks can ask questions again? Yes. As we move to the Q&A, please press pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. You will hear a notification where your line is unmuted. At that time, please then state your name and question. Once again, pressing pound two indicate that you wish to ask a question. To submit a written question, please select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, enter your question in the message box provided, and hit send. So we did have one question in the chat, which asked where funding utilization is displayed. Is this displaying percentage of, of use of all funds, in quotes, or the percentage of ABA? And it's the percentage of that budget authority, so ABA, annual budget authority. Once again, pressing pound two on your telephone keypad indicates that you wish to ask a question. So this is Greg with Oklahoma City Office, and um, I'm just going to jump in on the back end of that question. We do like to look at the, the leasing potential as a percentage of all funds, and forgive me if I just overlooked it. Is, is that there's one? So, uh, you're, so um, you're right, and it just depends on which number you're looking at within the uh, dashboard. So, for example, within the comparative analysis here, we have what is your year-to-date spending as a percentage of budget authority, and then we also have it when you're taking into account the reserves numbers. So it really just depends on which um, number you're looking at. This, peer, this number right here, when you're looking at the overarching trend analysis for budget utilization, is going to just be the budget authority. But when you want to look at these numbers here that include the reserves, that will be all funds. So um, it really just depends on which aspect you're looking at. But when you're looking at the trend analysis, it's definitely the overarching budget utilization using the ABA. 
And with regard to leasing potential, I know Mike can speak to it more, but it definitely is, in, uh, you know, utilizing the reserves amount to be able to do that calculation. Greg, Greg I wasn't sure if you were looking at the percent, leasing potential as a percent. That's looking at the leasing potential number divided by the ACC size of the program. But if you're asking about whether um, excess reserves, reserves over that 4% threshold, for example, uh, for PHEs over 500 units, that those dollars are included in the pot of money to which leasing potential uh, looks to. I've got a question. So this is David Kohler. Where, and, and maybe, Mike, it's a question about calculating leasing potential when, let's say it's a PHA that has excess budget you know, they have reserves available, but they're nearing their um, baseline units. What is the threshold the PHA has to hit on the unit leasing where they're no longer triggering leasing potential? So it does take into account, Dave, the uh, it won't, a leasing potential formula won't generate a number that will take the PHA over its ACC limit. Um, but I think it uses the full leasing potential. In other words, if you have a lot of dollars, it tells you your leasing potential will be up to the maximum size of your program. It won't, it won't set it, for example, at 95% or 98%. Dave, this is Mandy. Are you asking when they come off of the list? Well, I'm, I'm just want to make sure that we don't misinterpret data. So, so if, if you know, if, if you just looked at, if you didn't go back to the tool and you say, hey, you have leasing potential, you should be mm -hmm. issuing this. You know, if it's budgeted size, we know if you issue all those vouchers, it doesn't mean this is every voucher you can issue. You'll still have money left. But if if that number represents you getting to 100% of baseline, then it's a you know, we're walking them a little bit closer to the edge, so I'm not sure if I'm articulating yeah. that. It's, it's always going to shelter that 4, 6, 12 percent. It's always going to shelter but, that amount. But, but I guess the edge shel you're talking about, Dave, is the edge of the, lease, of the UMA cap. And, you, and you're right, it doesn't, it doesn't give a margin, like it gives a margin in the reserve for 4 percent. It doesn't give a margin in the UMA cap. But actually, um, this is such a seldom um, actual situation. There's very few PHAs that wind up being maxed out. It might be 5 or 6% in the country, but it's something to think about. And, and, and really, the leasing potential is a flag, right? It directs you to use the tool. Then you do the tool and do the projection uh, and, uh, you know, go where you want to go. You don't. I would never just use the leasing potential number as a number to then, you know, go right to. You have to figure out how many to issue. That depends on your success rate and the EOP rate. So it's a starting point to say if I have any leasing potential, I want to use the tool and go much deeper uh, in my analysis and then have it take me where I want it to go. Yeah, we were just encountering as You know, Mike, as I told you and Manny both, we're trying to, you know, it, uh, inform the board and the, the EDs about, hey, you're, you know, you have excess leasing potential and you're not realizing. And so we tend to, as you said, Mike, it's usually that threshold you have. So if we look just the reserves and say, well, you have 10% reserves and, uh, you know, 4% is kind of that safe harbor for your size PHA, you should be issuing more vouchers that if you don't go back and look at the baseline, you could, you could mistakenly tell them to issue more vouchers when they're already at their unit leasing baseline. So that's kind of where I was driving. It is, it is a rare occurrence, but, but it's something we have to kind of watch for. Yeah, and that, and that LP number does not take them over. It takes them up to the edge, but doesn't take them over. But again, it's just a flag. It's just to say, hey, take a look at this, do the tool, and see uh, what you can do, because there's all these other factors that, take, that matter when you're projecting how many units are going to be leased and how many how many dollars are going to be spent? Obviously, you know better than I do. And Dave, I think that one area sometimes on the tool that needs some clarification when working with the PHAs is um, that leasing potential number is 
it's cumulative, it's over a year. So sometimes they look at that and they go, okay, well, my limit is um, 100, I'm at 80, and you're telling me I can issue 40, and that would take me over the 100, and that's sometimes is confused because that 40 is not all at once every month for a year, it is over that period of time. So it's a little bit different way of adding up the available funding and that can sometimes throw people off. This is Lorraine Walls. How often do you suggest the housing authority should use the ACV tool? Because this is excellent to um, keep them on a monthly where they're tracking and everything in tandem with the ACV tool. So, thinking they should probably use it every month? What do you all think? Well, yeah, so good I, point, Lorraine. Yeah. It, it, just, just to uh, reiterate, too, this leasing potential number changes every month, or it can change every month, not wildly, but it can change every month because you have new data on what was spent, what was leased, what's on the street, what the cost per unit change is, so it pays, it pays to look at that uh, regularly. And I will uh, note that this will be updated monthly, so each month we will push out a new uh, dashboard with the newest data, and you'll always know the vintage of the dashboard with these little red boxes highlighting how current the data is here. Um, and so, yeah, I definitely, um, you know, I would defer to OFO, but I think that this is a, a helpful tool that um, I, I would check on every month. So it's definitely, you know, the numbers will shift and you'll see new leasing, you know, what, what changes have been made in your per unit cost and all sorts of different things that you might otherwise, um, you know, when you're down in the weeds, not be aware of. So, and we do expect the February numbers to be updated within the next week or so. It looks like this could be really good data, you know, summary data and so forth, but it, it still appears to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that now when I really want to drill down with the PHA and better understand, I'd still be going to the two-year tool, hopefully with, with the last two months of leasing data updated manually with my call with the PHA to get a better idea of where they really stand now today. Is there something in this dashboard that I can glean that I cannot glean from the two-year tool? So the biggest thing is whether, what your past has looked like. This, you know, the two-year tool really only provides the last year's worth of data in any part of the utilization reports. Um, this provides data much further back, so you can really see how these, if that trend that you're seeing over the last year is just part of a larger trend analysis. Um, similarly, like if you wanted to see like what trends you've been seeing around a lot of different, um, you know, your budget utilization, things like that. It's really a good indicator of what that's looked like in the past. Anytime you're gonna wanna be doing projections, I would definitely defer to the two-year tool and the payment standard tool and how those interact to be able to really help the PHA for forward-looking. Indeed, this is Mandy. I, I think that what Marika is saying, too, about the past can help your conversations with the PHA because you can um, come back and say, if they're struggling in a certain area right now, you can look back and say, well, you know what? Things were going really well in March of 2019. What was happening then that's not happening now? So you can kind of do some comparison um, you know, because you know, staff change and board members change, and this, it might help you find some ideas for, for making improvements. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you. Any other we questions? Sure? We're happy to answer anything. Our lines are open to the staff, right, not just the panelists? It should be. Yes, lines are open. Uh, there are currently no questions in the queue. 
Once again, as a reminder, please press pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. And feel free to use the uh, chat feature as well. And if anybody feels a little bit more tentative about asking a question in this forum, feel free to email us at hcv-dashboard at hud.gov and we would be happy to answer any questions you have there. As well as, um, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, we do always take ideas and suggestions for improvements. A lot of the changes that we made to this dashboard are the direct result of user feedback. So if you feel that something uh, that you would look at regularly could be added to this dashboard, I bet you other PHAs and other staff would find it helpful as well. So definitely share that with us and we can hopefully make it a reality. This is Greg again. I'll just add that this really, I mean, solves a, I'm not the most data aware person in the voucher program, but this solves a, a big problem for me in terms of being able to scan the landscape and see where my, where my uh, places are I need to give the most attention. And so I'm really appreciative of having this and we'll put it to good use with the WIG. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, if we don't have any more questions, I just want to say thank you guys, everybody, for joining us today. I really hope that this was helpful. Uh, we'll send around links to all these different, um, to this stat, to this website, but you could also always Google it at just writing HCV dashboard and HUD, and it will pop up as the first option. Um, but we appreciate everybody joining us today, and we hope that this is a useful tool. Um, thank you, everybody. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.